Well, good morning. Welcome to worship today. Whether you are in business class or in the economy section, we, we welcome you today and are glad that you are here. If you're visiting us online, we're also glad that you are with us for worship. We want to make a few announcements before we begin our service time today. And as we normally do, if you'd look through the bulletin with me, tonight we will be meeting back here for evening worship. We've been studying 1 Samuel. We're in the life of David right now, particularly his wilderness wanderings, and we're seeing the lessons that are there, uh, not only in his life, but for ours as well. So we encourage you to come back and be with us as we study tonight. There's a number of mission updates so that you can pray more uh, informed for our missionaries. We try to keep a few of these before you each week so that we can pray through the needs that our missionaries communicate. You'll note there is an announcement that pertains to the middle and senior high school young people. Uh, Kate and Scott and Haddon have set up a weekend retreat here and the details are here. Uh, everything you need to know is here and how it's going to run and they'll be having more information coming up. But please take note of that and plan to attend whichever parts of that you are able to attend. As you got the email, many of you this week, I'm sure, about the parking situation, we are happy to say that we can use the parking areas that are now uh, out from here. And I saw many of you out there this morning, a couple of the deacons doing donuts. Please don't do that on the new pavement, but you can use that area for parking. Now, we know many of you want to go up and look at the construction, but it is still dangerous. There's a lot of holes up there, trip hazards. So try to see it from a distance from outside the construction fence. We don't want anyone getting hurt in there. And there'll be more coming as the next step is to get the plumbing uh, started. So there's gonna be more ditches and everything else. So look at it from outside but we are uh, thanking the Lord that the foundation is now in and we're able to continue moving forward on this. How can you help? Well, we would like you to save the date of Saturday, December 5th. Uh, the deacons are going to have a work day here that was originally scheduled for leaf blowing and outside cleanup. But we also have the opportunity to save a significant amount of money if we plant the barrier, the tree barrier, uh, that's required by county ordinance ourselves. We have several men with augers that can dig the holes real quick, so we just need people to put the trees in the ground and backfill them with a shovel. So we are asking you to mark your calendar for December 5th, and Lord willing, the weather will cooperate, and we will uh, have a good turnout to get these couple of hundred trees uh, stuck in the ground so that we can be in compliance with county regulations. So thank you all for, for doing that. Also, when you come in uh, between Sunday school and church, please slow down, be careful. Uh, the Sunday school is letting out. Some of the kids are heading for the playground at a high rate of speed. Uh, we, we have a very narrow driveway right now, right there, so please be careful and slow down. Uh, the deacons are going to put a small little uh, speed hump there to help us remember that, but just be watchful uh, for all the kids that are, are running around. We thank you for caring for that. The ladies are going to be singing for us today, and you'll note they're going to ask you to join them on the last verse of that hymn, so please have that prepared when we get there. And then again, please take note of the Rees of Remembrance and the Christmas tree shop information. Hard to believe we are coming up on the end of the year and all these activities, but uh, these are all important in the life of our church and community. Well, as we come together to worship today, our meditation verse calls us to remember uh, the goodness of our God, Psalm 123. To you I lift up my eyes, O to you who are enthroned in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their master, and as the eyes of a maidservant to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God till he has mercy on us. And so let us prepare our hearts to worship 
this God who cares for us in such great love. If you would stand with me now and let us be called to worship today with words from Psalm 91 there in your bulletin, if you would respond with the bold face print. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and other his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near to you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Because we have...
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, <coughs> deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Do we believe? We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophet. <coughs> and we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Believers be infallibly assured that they are in the estate of grace and that they shall persevere therein unto salvation. Such as truly believe in Christ and endeavor to walk in all good conscience before him may, without extraordinary revelation, by faith grounded upon the truth of God's promises and by the Spirit enabling them to discern in themselves those graces to which the promises of life are made, and bearing witness with their spirits that they are the children of God, be infallibly assured that they are in the estate of grace and shall persevere therein unto the end. <coughs> Please be seated. Let us continue our worship of the Lord in song as we sing a version of Psalm 91, our call to worship this morning, found in the back of your bulletin, Who with God Most High Finds Shelter.
you would please stand with me for the reading of God's word. Today we will be hearing from the gospel according to Matthew, chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. That's Matthew 25, verses 14 through 30. For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little, I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he who had also the two talents came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also who had received the one talent came forward, saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant. You know that I reap where I have not sown, and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him, and give it to him who has two ten, who has ten talents. For to everyone who has will be more given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You may be seated. If you will now join with me for the prayer of confession, which is printed in your bulletin. Father God, you have given us a great salvation, and you have showered us with gifts from your hand. We praise you for your great love and provisions for us. Yet we confess that we often use your gifts to serve ourselves. We neglect the needs of many around us. We fail to use our talents and abilities for your glory and for the upbuilding of your kingdom. Forgive us, we pray, for these and our many sins. Give us grace to serve you and to serve others in your name, that we might hear you say to us, Well done, good and faithful servant. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's now take a moment of silent confession of our sins. Hear now the assurance of pardon uh, taken from Paul's letter to the Colossians. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. Let's now continue in prayer to the Lord. Our Father, we thank you um, for the great promises um, that we've heard from your word already today. We thank you for uh, the assurance from Psalm 91 that with God most high we might find shelter, that you cover us under the shadow of your wings. And as we think about the continued um, concerns that we have over the uh, pandemic in our land, we do pray indeed that you would keep us protected. We thank you, Father, that uh, so far there has not been serious consequences from the illness um, in our number, but we pray, Father, that you would uh, continue to do so. We pray that you would keep us healthy, 
um, and allow us to continue to meet together, to have joy in coming together to this place. And we pray that you would give wisdom to our leaders as they figure out how to navigate this. Uh, we thank you, Father, uh, that we're able to meet again for, in addition to worship in the morning and the evening, also for Sunday school and starting to have some other activities. We pray, Father, that the Sunday school classes might go well into your glory. We pray that you would be with each teacher, each assistant, as they help to uh, minister uh, good teaching out of your words um, to all of our number from the smallest to the oldest. And we pray, Father, that these might be a good uh, opportunity for us to grow in our faith and to grow in our understanding of the Lord Jesus Christ and his word and in our love for you and for one another. We pray that you would continue to give wisdom to um, our elders, to our deacons, um, to those who serve alongside them in committees um, to help with the direction of our church and how we serve one another. Um, we pray especially at this time for the building committee. We're thankful that we're seeing results, that we're able to now accommodate more people in our parking lot. We pray that you would continue to be with them as they uh, make decisions that the process might go on, that we might soon have a new building in which we are better able to serve one another. We pray for the associate pastor search committee. We pray that the right man might be found for the job, one who is able to serve our youth and families well, one who loves you and seeks to serve his church and this expression of it here at White Oak. Um, Father, we also pray for those who are homebound during this time, um, both those who are ordinarily unable to leave their homes and those who are having to make difficult decisions about theirs and their family's safety during this time. Um, we pray that you would, um, that the word might go out um, from this pulpit today, both to those who are gathered in this room, to those who are watching online as it's streamed, to those that will watch it later that it might be effectual as your word preached. We thank you, Father, that we are able to join in the spreading of your gospel throughout all this world um, through supporting missionaries. We pray that we would continue to keep them in mind as many, just as we are having to make compromises and difficult decisions here in Georgia, that there are even more difficult decisions in so many parts of the world. Uh, we pray particularly today for... Uh, Mark Whitty, as he serves in um, the, uh, the church in Toledo. We pray that, uh, thanking you that they are able to meet again, um, even as it is reduced numbers, we pray that it might soon be safe for them to meet with all of their number gathered. Um, we're thankful that, like us, they're able to have a live stream go out and reach others as well. We are thankful uh, with the report of Mark that they have two new families and a uh, another woman who have been beginning to visit during this time of even um, intense restrictions in the city of Toledo. We pray especially for this woman who he says is not a believer but is very open to the gospel. We pray that she might hear the gospel preached even this day and might uh, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. We pray also for David Galetta. Uh, we uh, support him as part of his teaching ministry um, as he goes throughout Africa and Asia training pastors and we pray for him during this time of preparation as he's not been able to make some of his trips as he seeks to uh, review his familiarity with the biblical languages and to learn Urdu the language of Pakistan that you might help him to do this well that he might be able to use these language skills for your glory as he teaches on your word in many parts of the world. And we pray, Father, that he might be able to, as he's currently planned, make the trip to uh, Uganda at the beginning of next year, and that that trip uh, might be effectual um, to what uh, the plans are. We pray also for our fellow Synod of Associate Reformed Presbyterians in the country of Pakistan. We pray that you would continue to support and uphold them uh, by your spirit. We're thankful for the report from the Reverend Gill about being able to meet again and some of the challenges they're facing. We pray that you would continue to be with Reverend Gill and the other ministers um, for the gospel in the country of Pakistan. And we also are aware, Father, that uh, the gospel needs to spread um, uh, throughout this world um, and also in our own country. We pray for the, reach, the outreach of um, ONA as 
There are uh, many church plants under, uh, undergoing in the United States, by the ARP especially. Um, we pray that you would be with church planters during this difficult time, that you would support them, and we pray that uh, this work might be done, that the gospel might continue to go to future generations and in other parts of the country where uh, work that was once laid might need to be laid again. And we pray, Father, that we would be part of this missions effort even here at our home, here in the Coweta County, Georgia area. We pray that we might be quick to give a defense for the reason of our faith. We pray that we might have opportunities to invite others to worship, to share an encouraging word with one another, to share a sermon, whatever the case might be, that we might be um, salt and light here in our community for the gospel, and that others might come and join and worship and serve alongside us. We pray that we might indeed be united as a body, um, as your church, uh, that we might be one, as the Lord Jesus Christ prayed in his high priestly prayer. And we pray, Father, that our church might be reformed um, by each and every passing week more and more to your word, that we might be formed and reformed to uh, be founded on the foundation of your word, that it might be our only trust, that we might uh, order everything that we do by your word. And we pray now that as we come to hear the word preached, that you would prepare us for it. We pray that you would be with Dr. Cook, that he might um, speak well, that we might hear the gospel message, and we might have uh, what the Spirit would have for us to know as we continue to study the uh, words of the Apostle John. We pray all these things in the name of Christ. Amen.
Thank you, ladies. Once more, if you would stand with me as we turn again to God's Word, 1 John chapter 4. <clears throat> Let us stand and hear His Word today as we look at this section of 1 John. Being a Christian necessitates discernment. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world. Therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. May God bless his word to us. Please be seated. If you're visiting with us, uh, we've been going through 1 John for some time now. This is our, our fourth look at this particular section of 1 John. We have uh, been building upon the foundation that's laid kind of verse by verse here in this section. And so today we want to particularly see how being a Christian necessitates discernment. Now we need to ask the question, first of all, don't we? What is discernment? Uh, I don't think I've heard that word used a lot in recent time, discernment. The dictionary, Oxford Dictionary, tells us that discernment is the ability to judge well. But if you stop to think about that, we have to have some kind of standard in order to judge well. We have to have some kind of starting point against which we might evaluate other truths so we could judge well. So biblically, discernment means, I think we could say in its simplest definition, the ability to decide between truth and error, between what is true in Scripture and what is said to be error in scripture. Therefore, then we are able to know biblically the difference between what is right according to God and what is wrong according to God. So discernment then is that process of making careful distinctions in our thinking about truth. It is the ability to think with discernment, with clarity about what is biblical and what is not biblical. Now thinking about that, when was the last time that you heard about or even thought about discernment in relationship to church or to religion in our day? It's been a while since anyone has ever talked about discerning between what is true and what is false. Because in our day, as soon as we say discernment, uh, someone else is charging us with being judgmental. In our day, when we say the word discernment, someone else is saying discrimination. And so today in our culture, in our church culture even, around, around our, our society, we hear a lot about love, we hear a lot about acceptance, we hear a lot about ecumenism, but we hear very little about discernment. As a matter of fact, Sometimes churches even cloud the water about discernment. You'll see a sign on many churches that say, all welcome. And the implication of that is, <clears throat> doesn't matter how you're living, doesn't matter what you're doing, doesn't matter what you believe, you're welcome. And biblically we can say that all are welcome to come to Jesus. But Jesus always then says to us, now you have to grow. Now you have to change. Now you have to become more like me. So here in our section of 1 John, this last section of these verses, we see, I think, that John is calling clearly for us 
to have discernment in the Christian life. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world. Therefore, they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Can you see the distinctions that John is putting before us here? There is a worldly way of thinking and there is a biblical way of thinking. Now John is saying nothing new. He is certainly in agreement with what Jesus taught and what Paul taught. For example, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 21 and 22, Paul reminds us that it is the duty of every Christian to be discerning. He says, examine everything carefully. Hold fast to what is good and abstain from every form of evil. Do you hear the the, the discernment that has to be there to examine and then to make decisions on what is good and to make decisions on what is evil. And so scripture calls us this. And really, we could say, I think, that the need for discernment has been present throughout all of our history, hasn't it? All of human history, all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Consider how the evil one, the devil, tempted Eve and confronted Eve. What what was it he was really saying to her? As he approached her about questioning God's motives and God's commands, he's really asking her these questions, isn't he? Is God really so harsh and difficult and unloving to you that he has forbidden you to eat of a certain tree? Do you really mean to tell me that God doesn't think any more of you than to keep something back from you? that you think would be good for you? What a mean God that is. I would never keep something back from you that would be beneficial to you and would bring you happiness and joy. How could God be a God of love and tell you not to do something? Can you hear that in what Satan's temptation was? It's the way he always comes with his deceit, isn't it? The devil says, you know, if you will take of this fruit, you will discover wonderful things. You will become as gods. You will enter a wonderful world that you never dreamed of. You'll discover things that you never thought were possible that that God is trying to keep from you as your friend, as your counselor, as your companion. I would never keep anything from you that would bring you such happiness. Go ahead, take that fruit and eat of it. How would our history be changed if our first parents would have exercised spiritual discernment and would have heard that temptation for what it was and run the other way? Yet, in most areas of our lives, discernment is good, isn't it? We, we accept it in some areas. For example, we teach our children not to take candy from strangers. Don't take rides from people you don't know. Why? Because we know there are people out there who would exploit those who might be naive. And yet, spiritually, we throw caution to the wind. And we have this attitude in our mind today that just says everybody's right. All truth is right. Everybody's truth is their own truth and should be allowed to believe whatever they want to believe. And John says that's not the case, that there are those that speak from the world and there are those that speak from God. They are not the same thing. I remember hearing the story about an elementary class, this was before COVID, that that was touring a medical facility. You know how they'll sometimes take field trips for young children so they get to see different things, and and they they went to a medical facility, and one of the young children on the field trip asked one of the nurses there, why are you always washing your hands around this place? And she said, we wash our hands for two reasons. We love health and we hate germs. See? We love health and we hate germs. And here, John is telling us that to be a Christian is to love good, to love the things of God, 
and to hate what is of the world, what is of the evil one. And he's calling us now to then discern and discriminate between truth and error. And yet, so many Christians, not just in our day, but down through the history of the church, have not heeded this call to biblical discernment. I was thinking, getting this sermon ready, what are some of the voices that the world throws out today that even we as Christians can hear? Uh, you may add more to this. I'm, I just thought of a few examples. We, we have in religious circles <clears throat> those that we might call uh, more liberal in their theology. And these people who, even though they have a word church outside their structure, say that the Jesus of history is really not important. The virgin birth of Jesus isn't important. His life uh, miracles, he may have done them, he may not. Uh, his resurrection even isn't even important. Uh, the person of Jesus as we know him is really not important at all. What's important is his teachings, the things he said. Now what's wrong with that? Not only does it contradict scripture, but first of all, then you have to say his teachings about what? Because a lot of his teachings were the very things we just touched on, who he was, where he was from, what his true nature was. So really, we have to get rid of those things, those people say, and we just have to concentrate on love. See how he told us to love one another, be, be good to the poor, uh, meet the needs of others. That's what's really important. The rest of that stuff about Jesus and the Bible may or may not be true. It, it probably uh, had some merit to it at some point, but the church has embellished these things over the years to make Jesus more than he really was. And there are hundreds of thousands of people, just like you sitting in rooms, just like this today, that think they're Christians, that swallow that hook, line, and sinker. But what does John say? If you don't believe that Jesus was the Messiah, God come in the flesh, as we looked at last week, the divine God himself coming as a man, then you are listening to the spirit of the Antichrist. Now, I didn't say that. John says that. Other scriptures say that. But you can't have this Jesus that you invent and say that his teaching was good. That's another sermon. What's another voice that we hear that calls out on us? Not so, not so big today, uh, but was quite big in this nation some years ago, especially uh, in many cities, is the, is the teaching of Christian scientists. Now, they're not Christian and they're not scientists, so I don't know how they got their name, but they call themselves Christian scientists. And Christian scientists uh, basically are a retread of an ancient heresy that was present in its, in its early form, even in John's day, called docetism. And docetism said that the man, Jesus, was just a man like everybody else. But as his baptism, the Spirit of God came on him, and before the cross, the Spirit of God left him. And that's why Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because God used him for a time and then abandoned him, and he died this death of the cross. And Christian science agrees with liberalism now. They'll say what's important about this Jesus is not that he was God or not God, not that he was uh, from God or eternal. What's important is what he taught, what he said. And they'll have a whole different emphasis about the things he said. But again, they're back to this category, aren't they? They deny that Jesus is God come in the flesh. And so John says what? They are of the spirit of Antichrist. They are pulling you away from Christ. Here's one that's probably going to step on some people's toes. But what about Mormonism? Huge in our day. Uh, probably one of the fastest growing religious groups in the world, certainly in our country, Mormons. Everybody uh, sees them on television. You see their uh, temples up around different places. You see their churches, quote-unquote, in different places, but they claim to be another testament of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Well, that they got right. They certainly are another testament, but they have nothing to do with the first four Gospels in the New Testament that our Scripture teaches. Mormons do not believe the same thing we do, though they cloak it in all the, the structures that the Christian church has, including Christmas. They have the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. They can outsing um, most of us, all the good Christmas carols, can't they? But Mormons do not believe the same gospel that we do. What do they believe? What do they tell people when their bicycle, white shirt-wearing missionaries come to your door with their name tags? What is it they're selling you? What is it they're trying to tell you? They're telling you that there are many gods, not just one, there are many gods, and they are telling you that you, as a person, as a man, especially as a man, can become God. This is what they teach, their catechism. Are there more gods than one? Yes, many. What else do they teach? Joseph Smith, their founder, says, you have got to learn how to be gods yourselves and to be kings and priests to God, the same as all gods have done before you. What else do they teach? God himself was once as we are now and is an exalted man. Right there you need to hear, eh, eh, eh. the alarm needs to be going off. God was once as we are now and is an exalted man and sits in yonder heavens. In another place they write, he was once a man like us, yea, that God himself, the Father of us all, dwelt on an earth the same as Jesus Christ did. And then Lorenzo Snow, the fifth president of the Latter-day Saint Church, wrote in 1983, as man is, as man, as God once, as man is, God once was, and as God is, man may become. Wow, is that the God of Scripture? No, that is a false God. That is a God that the world is throwing at you, and it gets wrapped in this nice, tidy bow of family life and moral living and success and all the rest, but they do not believe what you believe. The Scriptures teach that there is one God who is eternal in three persons, and that the second person of that trinity came and took on flesh and became a man, the God-man for all time. And that the reason that he had to come was not so that we can become gods, but so that we would be saved from our sins. And I have references here if you want them to those quotes. But they do not believe what you believe. They are the spirit of Antichrist. As successful as they are, as big as they are, as rich as they are, they are the spirit of of Antichrist because they do not point to Jesus as a savior. They point to Jesus as one who has set the example of how you may become God like he did. What about the prosperity gospel movement certainly screaming at us today? Hundreds of thousands of Christian people in churches think that this is the right way to go. But if you listen to them, if you listen to the preaching of the prosperity gospel you will rarely hear about sin you will rarely hear about salvation you will rarely hear that there is a need to change our way to repent to turn to god and to move away from our sin they they shroud the gospel in other things and are of the spirit of the world they are the spirit of antichrist and then there's the world itself, isn't there? I mean, that's where John is really taking us here. We've been leading up to this. We've been looking at, at so-called religious groups that are cloaking this. But then there's the blatant teaching of the, quote, world around us or the spirit of the age in which we live. What is the spirit of the world? Well, it's speaking without discrimination about spiritual things, isn't it? They can talk about the soul, they can talk about heaven, they can talk about eternal life, but they have no clue what they are talking about. I'm going to give you a great word. The Germans used to call, the German philosophers used to call this, this spirit of the world the Zeitgeist. 
Now, you might say, we're not German. Why do we need to know this? Well, if you're a, you're a high school student here and, you, or, and you're going to college and you have to take a sociology course or you have to take a philosophy course, someday this word's going to come in handy. It's worth at least half a point on your grade to throw that out and to say, well, the Zeitgeist is what? And what they meant by that, what is the spirit of the age? What is the spirit of the day? So for example, they wrote that the spirit of the 1960s, any of you who lived through this and still remember them, God bless you, uh, the spirit of the age was free love, was, was, you know, acceptance for all, free love, let's have at it, let's have a party. That was sort of the zeitgeist of the 60s. Somebody has said, what's the zeitgeist of the present day? I think the zeitgeist of the present day, the spirit of our age, is this idea of approval of everything and everyone. That there's no discrimination, that everybody's right, everybody has their own truth. That's the zeitgeist of the day we live in. And as soon as you say somebody's wrong, something is wrong, some teaching is wrong, oh, you're just harsh. You're unloving. You're unkind. That's the zeitgeist of the spirit of the day in which we live. And every age has them, you see? And so John is speaking to us today, and he's saying to us, there are people who are from the world. They speak from the world, and the world listens to them. And you know this. You watch the news, right? And you listen to many of the things that are being said, and in your mind you're saying, what kind of a lunatic believes that kind of stuff? Deceived people, you say. People from the world, and the world loves them and listens to them because they have nothing to base it against. But as we go as Christians to the scripture, we are corrected as we hear that falsehood thrown at us. Now, this isn't new. If you have your Bible, look at 1 Peter chapter 4, a great section of scripture that ought to be on your uh, tongue all the time, that you ought to know where it is. And, and, And let's ask if this does not sound like the spirit of our age, the zeitgeist of the present day. 1 Peter 4. Peter says, since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourself with the same way of feeling, believing, what's he say? Thinking. Arm yourself with the same way of thinking, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, lawless idolatry. Ring any bells? (laughs) You see, this has been the spirit of the world all the way along, hasn't it? This is what the world thinks brings them fulfillment, brings them happiness, brings them meaning in life. What does Peter say? He addresses the need for discernment and a life of discernment. Verse 7, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. That's what we read from the gospel this morning, isn't it? The parable of the servants who each were given gifts. Peter's telling us as we live in times of discernment, serve one another, don't just serve ourselves. In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Now, does the world think that way? Is that the spirit of the day in which we live? No, I passed over this middle section because here's the the punch of what Peter's saying. Look at verse 4. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you. You see the distinction that's here. The world is shocked when we don't live their way and they can't understand why we live a different way according to scripture and they will malign you for it. It should be no surprise to us why governments, as they become more and more anti-Christian, less founded on the word of God, more and more seek to persecute the church. They want to silence it, you see? 
But it's also no surprise when Christians take themselves away from the mooring of God's word that they begin to think in these same ways too and ultimately drift away. And so John is calling us here that we need to have discernment. We need to understand that the world is different than what the scripture says. And we have to constantly be aware of this and living accordingly, listening to the word of God and turning away from the voices of deception. John says it so clearly, doesn't he? The difference between the two spirits. They are from the world. Therefore, they speak from this world. And the world listens to them. You know how this is. You have friends in this category. You might have family members in this category. And they live a certain way. And <clears throat> when you try to talk to them about it, and <clears throat> you try to tell them what Scripture says, they, they, it's like they have cotton in their ears. They don't want to hear it. They'll resist. They'll fight back. They, they say, uh, you know, you believe what you believe, and I believe what I believe. Well, that's marvelous. But in the end, somebody has to say who's right and who's wrong. And the voice from heaven comes from saying, I'm right. All of you are wrong if you don't follow me. So what do we do? How are we to live knowing this, this discernment has to be part of our life? Eric Alexander, a Scottish pastor, wrote this. The only way I know to cultivate a spirit of discernment and true wisdom is being, in being able to tell the difference between truth and error is a concentrated commitment to the study of Scripture. That's it. The only way that we can be people of discernment, the only way that we can be people who are not listening to the world but following after God is a concentrated study of Scripture. Now, if you're here this morning, great. You've taken step one. Worship, preaching ought to be step one for anybody who, who is a Christian. Ought to be in church or if not able to come personally right now, listening online, step one. But then what? That's certainly not a concentrated study of scripture. I challenge anybody to have one meal Sunday morning at 11 o'clock and then don't eat the rest of the week and see how it goes for you, you see? A concentrated study of scripture means we begin to integrate personal Bible reading in our life. Perhaps we might do that really fanatical thing of coming back to evening service and hearing the word a second time. We might go to Sunday school class. We might be in a home Bible study. We might be in a small group, you see. We do study on our own because the only way to have discernment is to grow in our knowledge of the Word of God. And so the question for us as we come away from this first section of 1 John 4 is to ask the question, are you a man of God's Word, a woman of God's Word, a young person of God's Word, a student of of God's word because discernment doesn't come just from the air it comes from as our Eric Alexander says a concentrated study of scripture and what is the scripture well the scripture is the word of God himself given to us by his apostles and prophets it is the word that God has given to us as his people that reveals his character that reveals his nature that reveals what he approves of and what he dis disapproves of and so no matter what my thinking on an a, a matter might be in the flesh, I am called constantly to yield to the teaching of Scripture. And if there's something I don't understand about it, to dig in deeper or to ask other people or to get counsel on those things that I'm not sure about. But this is the answer, you see. And so John throughout this section has been telling us, test the spirits. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. That doesn't mean we just sit back and say, all is well, all is done. Because the spirit of the world continues to scream at us, and the spirit of God continues to be that never-moving beacon of truth and righteousness to us that we all need to hear. And so may we flee to Christ, put away lesser things, lesser ideas. May we constantly take ourselves back to the word, Yield to that word. Let that word be, as the psalmist says, a lamp to our feet and a light to our path because that is the way that we walk in discernment in the things of the Lord. May he bless us with this as he's kept us to this point. May he keep us in the days to come. Let us pray together. <clears throat> Father, we can be lazy people and we confess that. We 
we find it easier just to say everyone has their own truth. Well, who are we to judge? Well, that's good for them. However, the excuses might go. But we pray that you would give us a hungering and thirsting to know your word so that as we hear all these voices that are screaming in the world today, that we might be able to discern that still small voice of your spirit that speaks to us through the canon of scripture. How grateful we are that the Lord Jesus has come into this world as the light of this world to dispel the darkness And that not only by his life and death and resurrection, but also then by sending forth his word through the apostles and prophets, that he has given to us that eternal revelation that will never pass away, that will never be undermined, that will never be shown to be false, but is the light for all of us to follow. We confess that we at many times in our lives perhaps have not been very discerning, and we're grateful that you keep calling us back. But give us a resolve, we pray, that we might continue to flee to your word, that we would be students of your word, that we would study that word, they would not let it sit on our shelf through the week or simply attend to it one hour on a Sunday morning, but that we would be people who swim in that word that you have given to us as a great ocean of your character and love and desires for us. And so we come to you asking you to do this in Jesus' name and for the sake of his kingdom and his church. Amen. Our last hymn this morning certainly uh, calls us to yield to that word. Let us stand and worship the Lord in song one last time. Lead me, Lord, lead me in thy righteousness. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the peace of the Holy Spirit rest on you now and forevermore. Amen. Let's go in peace.